From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudgie Mudler, and this matters. Is the fourth wave of COVID-19 inevitable? Or is it already here? There are plenty of signs of positivity in Ontario and across Canada. Case counts are dropping and our vaccination rate leads the world. Our cities are reopening and many of us are already enjoying a two-shot summer. Of course, this is the part in the movie where we think the bad guy is gone only for them to reveal themselves once again. Around the world, the Delta variant is running rampant, with rising case counts and mask mandates returning to some jurisdictions. The thing is, in countries where vaccines are accessible, it is those waiting or choosing to be unvaccinated who are getting sick. And this has ramifications for all of us. Colin Furness is an infection control epidemiologist and assistant professor at the University of Toronto. He's joined us before to share his expertise, and we welcome him back to This Matters. Colin, thank you so much for making the time once again. My pleasure, thanks. So Colin, one of the reasons we have you here is the discussion about the fourth wave. I've heard everything from it's a matter of not if, but when, to some holding out hope that perhaps we will not have it. What do you think about this? When will it be here? Is it already? It would be avoidable if we could get vaccination rates up to a certain level that I don't think is achievable. And I think it would be avoidable if we were really smart in terms of our restriction lifting and being quite selective. And we're not doing that either. So if there are conditions to avoid a fourth wave, we're not there and not aiming there. And so I come down on the side of, yes, it's, it's inevitable. But the word wave, I think, is pretty terrifying because of what we have suffered through already. This isn't going to be the same as that. And I don't think I would be very surprised if we ended up having to have wide scale lockdowns and, and this sort of thing. I, I don't think that's in our future. This one's going to be different because there's going to be differential risk, differential exposure, depending on your vaccination status. The other thing that I keep hearing is that this is going to be the pandemic of the unvaccinated. I want to know what exactly does this mean? And you just sort of touched on it. What are we looking at and what will this look like? Well, I think that's a, on one hand a fair statement because we know vaccines work and we know what happens then to your risk if you're not vaccinated. We can also look at it and say COVID is now two to two and a half times more contagious than it was last summer. So risky behaviors among people who are taking on added risk by not getting vaccinated will be proportionately much more dangerous. So I think from that perspective, yes, this is going to be a wave of the unvaccinated. However, that doesn't mean that people who are vaccinated can do whatever they want and get off scot-free. It's not so simple as that. For one thing, a lot of people have kids under 12 in a, in a house. They're unvaccinated, not by choice. They're vulnerable. They're susceptible. And if you're vaccinated, and let's say you're fully vaccinated and, and you're very healthy and you really don't have much to fear, COVID doesn't know any of this. And so if you expose yourself, if you end up mixing with unvaccinated people who are infected, you will get COVID in your nose and throat and it will start to reproduce because that's what COVID does. Your body will come down on it like a bag of hammers because you're vaccinated and you'll clear it in a day or two and you'll never experience disease or illness. But there could be a period of time there, however brief, a day or two, maybe hours, where you're shedding virus, maybe shedding a lot of virus. The Delta variant has a higher initial load, much higher than previous forms of COVID. And I'm not an immunologist, so I don't want to talk at length about that. But to me, it seems more likely that you may be transmissible even for a fleeting period of time. So that means when we say it's a, it's a pandemic or a wave of the unvaccinated, we have to remember that vaccinated people do get sick too. Sometimes, as they say, they get infected and pass it on. But in some cases, if you already have uh, existing conditions, if you're older, if, if your body hasn't responded ideally to the vaccine, then you can end up getting sick as well. There's about a 90% reduction in your risk, but it's not 100. And the difference between 90 and 100 is going to matter for some people. So there's a lot of ways that we could say this is a wave of the unvaccinated, but we should also look at it as a risk to people who are vaccinated. And one other thing, if our healthcare system gets overburdened, if that happens, that affects all of us, right? So that's a problem. We all need our healthcare system, regardless of vaccination status. So there's a few different ways we could look at how we characterize this upcoming wave. There's a ton of stuff in there that I want to unpack. You know, the numbers I'm seeing, obviously it's about 80% of people in Toronto, 65% of people across Canada, vaccinated right now. 
Could our healthcare system be overburdened once again, even if it is sort of that small percent of unvaccinated people? We don't have enough data to be able to predict that confidently. I think it's a risk. We don't have that many ICU beds. I mean, ICU beds are very expensive to maintain. So the idea that we'll have all this slack capacity that we might need it one day, that's, that's really not how healthcare works. So it doesn't take much to put a restraint on our healthcare system. You know, it, it's certainly a risk, certainly an issue. Our vaccination rates are high, but they're not evenly high. And so what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you take an average, the average percent vaccination across the country, those numbers look pretty good. But when you drill down, you realize that the oldest people have very high penetration, really amazing. And many of the younger ones, let's say people in their 20s, even in their 30s, actually much lower. And men also much lower than women. So if you look at the subgroup of, say, men in their 20s, you know, that's a population. That's a group that hangs out together. That's a group that is going to be much, much higher risk than the overall average across the country might suggest. So I think we need to be careful about looking at these giant aggregate means and saying we're in good shape. Some groups are in way better shape or way less risk than others. And again, you know, men in their 20s aren't so likely traditionally to end up in the ICU, but the Delta variant is more virulent as well as more contagious. It's still new. We're still just collecting data on that. But, you know, science from the UK suggests that hospitalizations will go way up here because they did go way up there. Kieran Moore, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, was estimating and saying possibly September and when the colder weather comes, he's expecting these case counts to rise up. And that's when sort of he's pegging the fourth wave to hit. What did you think about that sort of timeline? That matches my expectations pretty closely. I think it's going to be less predictable, again, because COVID is a little less predictable than we might wish. You see jurisdictions in the United States that have released restrictions and they've gone for quite some time without seeing a precipitous rise. And then all of a sudden, and that's the thing about exponential growth. It seems like nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden, you know, I would say that in Ontario, the fourth wave started on July 16th. That's the day that we said unvaccinated people can start sharing indoor air without wearing masks for restaurants and gyms and and movie theaters and and, and a few other environments like that, that triggers transmission. We know this. This is not a matter of guess or supposition. We know this. So case counts are already starting to rise, but we're not noticing it yet. We're not going to notice it for a while. Dr. Moore thinks it'll be in September. I agree. My predictions have been pretty good over the last 16 months, but COVID tends to show up a little earlier than I was expecting. So that makes me scratch my head and say, if I think September, does that mean earlier? Or maybe have I you know, adjusted my, uh, my guesstimation machine and, and it's bang on? It's inevitable, pretty hard to pick the date that we're going to see that big uptick. And also, because the epidemiology of the Delta variant is still not really fully understood, it's going to be pretty hard to say how steep is that curve going to be and what's that going to look like for hospitalization. I think it's going to be messy. But I do not expect that we're going to have to have giant lockdowns and giant restrictions. I think we'll be able to be smarter than that because, again, COVID is going to be showing up in certain places and not others. So I think we ought to be able to be smart enough to have targeted restrictions and not have to do broad. I hope that our broad lockdown suffering is a thing of the past. Oh, I hope so, too. You mentioned it already, but... What about kids? I have a nine-year-old daughter. There's some of these plans that are talking about schools just going back business as usual, unmasked. That sounds to me Delta is probably going to rip through schools. And I mean, you just recently also, I saw on your Twitter, you posted child hospital admissions in the UK, and those numbers are looking very scary to me. What do you have to say to a parent like me and other listeners? Yeah, let's start with the UK data. It's complicated because the UK sometimes reports visits to the emergency room as hospitalizations. So those numbers can look higher. However, I've also looked at what are legitimately hospital admissions. On one hand, there's millions of kids in the UK and 50 admissions a day is not gigantic. On the other hand, cumulatively, 50 children a day being admitted means 19,000 per year. That's, That's high. That's really high, maybe not compared to adults, but certainly compared to the number zero, which is what a lot of people say happens with kids. There's a lot of discourse out there. Kids don't get it. Kids don't get sick. Kids aren't at risk. Well, they do, and they are. And sometimes about, I think about 4% of cases end up being really serious. By really serious, I mean autoimmune or brain damage. And we don't know what the long-term effects are in kids. Kids can be pretty resilient, but to say brain damage is okay in kids because they're just kids, that's nothing I would ever accept. So the question is, what risk standard are we willing to apply to our children? 
that's tough because they're not able to make their own health decisions. And even if they were, they're not able to be vaccinated yet. So I think we have to approach this with kid gloves, so to speak. We have to be very cognizant that this is a vulnerable group. So my, you know, my advice to, to parents with kids, and I also have a nine-year-old child at home, is you can be fully vaccinated and have the best of intentions, get exposed, have COVID reproducing in your nose and throat for a day or two. You never experience illness or disease because you're vaccinated, but you might be shedding some virus. And is that what you want to do? So my own position, and I, there hasn't been great guidance in Ontario on this, but my own position is I'm not sharing air with anybody that I don't know to be vaccinated. So I'm not going to restaurants. I'm not going to movie theaters. I'm not going to gyms. I'm not doing that. And I'm not doing that until my child is vaccinated. At that point, I think then we can take another look at prevalence and another look at emerging variants and, and come up with a new risk assessment. But if I, if I didn't have a child at home, I, I might well be okay going to the gym and thinking I'm otherwise healthy and I, sh I should be okay. But it's having those children at home, I think that to me makes it very, very important that parents and family members Take it for what it is, a vulnerable person at home who cannot choose to be protected and who can get sick less often than adults, less severe than adults on average. But there's going to be some very sick children in our future. And I think it's going to be tragic when we start to see that. We'll be right back. Colin, what are you watching right now? I mean, the surges right now in the UK, France, and the Netherlands are all looking very worrisome to me. And I mean, a lot of people say we have to look at the UK as sort of the, they're a little bit ahead of us. So what are you watching? I think that's all true. I think those provide cautionary tales. And, and for the last 16 months, we have proven remarkably resilient to learning from the lessons of others. It, it is frankly shocking to me in some ways that we can watch these things go on. And, you know, some members of the public don't pay attention to the news. And so they're not looking at that. But government and policymakers and decision makers certainly are. And the idea that, oh, that can't happen here because magic, because some unknown protection that we that we can somehow invoke. So I think it's, it's very clear where those countries are going. That's where we're following. I wish we used that to make a smarter plan for reopening. Because I want to be clear, I want to reduce restrictions. I want to open up. I don't want people to continue living under this really, really dreadful way of being. No question. But we could be smarter. And I think what I would point to specifically is that Ontario, like so many other places, has still not officially used the word airborne. We haven't said it's airborne. Therefore, we haven't adjusted regulations. We haven't adjusted plans. We haven't adjusted anything. And so when Ontario recently announced just a day or two ago that, oh, colleges and universities can go full steam ahead, in-person education, no physical distancing, whoever came up with that has never seen the kinds of classrooms that I have to teach in sometimes. They are cheek and jowl, that the temperature in the room rises perceptibly over the course of an hour or two because they're being filled with everyone's exhalations and body heat. So we've got what I would call a very, very dangerous situation that's predicated on a hope and a prayer that somehow Ontario won't, it won't be airborne in Ontario for some reason. Well, it is. And, and that inertia is actually a real weakness in public health, in medicine, in science generally, that it takes a long time for discoveries in the data to be implemented all the way down to regulations. So public health regulations right now are not reflecting what we know. The stage one, stage two, stage three plan does not reflect Delta variant. It doesn't reflect airborne. It doesn't reflect any of the things that we know. So if I could have the ear of Dr. Moore, I think what I'd do is sit down and say, I know you inherited a plan. You've only been in the office for a few weeks. This plan is like a giant social contract with 15 million people in Ontario. And that social contract says we're going to open up and we're going to do it with these criteria. So I know all of that. But we're in stage three now. And I think what we need to do is to stand up and say, we need a new plan. We've made it this far but we have new knowledge, we have new awareness, we have new ability, I think, to design smart interventions, smart regulations, and open up in a smart way. So I'd like to see a new plan, and that new plan recognize airborne, and that it recognize Delta variant transmissibility. We can still open up tons, but there's certain things we shouldn't do. And number one on that list is unvaccinated people sharing air without masks. 
that is just a giant mistake. That's the fourth wave right there is that particular thing. So I think we need a change. We need a change in plans. I don't want to blame Dr. Moore for the fact that he's new on the job and the fact that this plan was put into place before we had all this new knowledge. But I think there's an opportunity there to pull the tiller, really pull the tiller, make use of this new knowledge and make a new plan. Colin, you're being pretty dire here, which I think is fair, but you mentioned earlier that we might be able to avoid lockdowns. What are some of the smarter restrictions that we may be able to do? One suggestion being talked about is mandating all university students getting double vax before returning to campus. What do you think about that? What should we be doing? So two things, right? One is preventing transmission and the other is through social controls, right? So restrictions on what you're able to do. And the other is vaccination. Let's start with vaccination. I really strongly oppose mandatory vaccination. And I say that because what it does is it actually stokes the anti-vax movement. It's like terrorism. The more you attack and bomb cities that you don't like, the more terrorists emerge and they're in it from the rubble. It's the same. It's, I would say it's exactly the same process. You don't want to do it in a mandatory way, but there's a lot of levers that you can pull. And you've identified a couple of them yourself right there, which is to say, hey, if you want your education in person, and I think everyone's pretty positive right now that for most people, education in person is way better than education on a computer screen. That's very, very clear. If you want that in person, then this is what you need to do. And if you want to go see a movie, this is what you need to do. And if you want to travel, this is what you need to do. And no one is going to make you. It's up to you to decide what activities you want to engage in and what's required to do it. If you want to drive, you are required to have a driver's license. It's what you need to do. So if you want to travel, you need to have immunizations. It's what you need to do. We already have, and we have had for almost a century, I think, a requirement to be immunized to attend public school. This is more of the same. So it is baffling to me that we're actually undoing some very simple rules around vaccination. So again, if families want to educate their kids at home, they have the right to do that. And they should have the right to do that. And if they want to not vaccinate their families, they should have the right to do that. What they don't have the right to do, in my estimation, or shouldn't, is to impose their unvaccinated risk profile on people who don't want that. So I think there's a lot we could do in terms of levers around making life a little less convenient for people who are unvaccinated and a little bit more convenient and exciting for people who are. So I think those are policy levers we could pull. And there's a large range of things that we, I think we could do. So that's enormous. The other piece, as I said, is, is restrictions on what people are able to do. It would be so disappointing to have to do wide range lockdowns at all. That would be so disappointing. There's just a few things and they're all pivot around the same thing I've already mentioned, which is unvaccinated people sharing air indoors. Let's not have it. So again, this is where these two converge, vaccination and restrictions. If you want to go to the gym, get vaccinated. And if you don't get vaccinated, you don't go to the gym. So we can actually, I think, open up just about everything as long as we're obeying the, you know, we can call Collins golden rule. Don't share air without a mask if you're not vaccinated. That's really the big number one thing. That allows us to do most things. It really does. But Again, I think you cannot force vaccination, even among healthcare workers, I wouldn't force vaccination. How we nudge those folks along is very simple. If you want to have patient contact, you need to be vaccinated. If I was trained to care for patients and I end up having to work a full shift in the soiled laundry room without patient contact because I don't want to be vaccinated, I've made my choice. And if I have the choice then to go get vaccinated and, and return to caring for patients, then I can make that choice. That's the way that we should be coping with healthcare workers. No one should be forcibly vaccinated, we can do it with policy levers. Is there any possibility of no fourth wave at all? I mean, do we have to hit an incredible amount of vaccination rate that we just, is it out of the picture? Is it mathematically impossible? So we can only speculate actually, and that's because the epidemiology of COVID is changing so fast. The concept of herd immunity, right? There's some threshold at which COVID stops circulating. And that's, that's it's a theoretical point. It is real in that that's how herd immunity works. The problem is we can't pinpoint where that is. Herd immunity, that percent vaccination depends on two things. It depends on how contagious the virus is, and it depends upon how effective the vaccine is. And the problem that we're facing is that with the Delta variant, both of those numbers are in flux. They're both changing. The vaccine is a little bit less effective and not hugely, but a little bit less effective. And the contagiousness is going way up. And how we actually measure that contagiousness, that's really hard. That's enormously difficult to do because we're trying to compare something from a year ago when all sorts of things were different. So there's so many different variables in there that we can't pinpoint it. So we don't even know exactly what that number is supposed to be. We'll have to, I guess, discover it. 
But remember, there was uh, up in the Yukon Territory, there's population vaccination rates well into the 80s, very high. And they're having a COVID outbreak anyway, right? So even when your numbers, when your percents are high, when you look at the numbers, you still have a large number of unvaccinated people. By the time schools start in September, we'll have something like 4 million unvaccinated people in Ontario. That includes all the kids who can't be and all the people over 12 who are not to be. That's a large number. I mean, if Ontario had only 4 million people in it, we wouldn't say that we're immune to COVID, would we, right? We would say that we've got 4 million people who might catch COVID. It doesn't change that much when you've got 11 million vaccinated people cohabiting with them. You still have those 4 million. So when you ask, you know, is there any way to avoid it? The two things we would have to do is vaccinate eligible people way into the 90s to deal with the fact that our kids in under 12 can't. And I, I can't give you a precise number, but I think it would have to be in the 90s. And we would have to change our restrictions. We would have to not let unvaccinated people share air with vaccinated people without masks. You just don't want to do that. And if we did both of those things, yes, we could probably sidestep a fourth wave. But I just don't see either of those happening. There's no, there's no sense that either of those is happening. I think when we get to the point that we can vaccinate our kids, and if we're lucky, that will be before the end of the calendar year. That's plausible. I'm not, I'm not able to promise it. It really depends on the trials. But we should have some data in September and a lot more data by October. So the Health Canada approval process is going to depend on the quality of that data. And we have to figure out dose for kids. So it's not even just safety and efficacy. It's also effective dose. You know, that's complicated. Once we get that done, our herd immunity will probably be easier to establish. We'll know more about the Delta variant. We'll know more about the rates at which unvaccinated people versus vaccinated people are getting sick. And just inoculating our kids under 12, which we can do in school, we can do that very effectively. Just doing that could easily push us over that threshold where COVID is not just not something we need to worry about so much anymore. That would be amazing. The one last thing I'll say is, and what's really out of our control is what's happening elsewhere in the world. As long as there's a ton of COVID circulating globally, we have to be concerned that there could be new variants emerging and those new variants may actually challenge the vaccine. And so we may need to think about a booster shot in the winter. Pfizer's working on one. Canada has already inked a contract to buy that. So those pieces are in place. That could well be in our future. That is a crystal ball question. All we could say is the more global prevalence there is, the more likely new variants will emerge. And when you've got a global population that is a mixture of people who are fully vaccinated, partly vaccinated and not vaccinated, you've got a perfect Petri dish for COVID to find its way around the vaccine. So it's, it's quite plausible that will happen, not inevitable. And I guess the sooner that we can vaccinate the world, the sooner that we can drive COVID down, the safer we'll all be. So, you know, that's a long winded way of saying that my long term view on this is actually really quite optimistic. It seems to me that by 2022, early 2022, we'll have that herd immunity. I think we will, partly because of kids, partly because when we see the numbers in the ICUs and in hospitals and the proportion that are unvaccinated, I think a lot of people sitting on the fence will jump off that fence and go ahead and get the jab. So it feels to me like we will be past that threshold, even though I can't tell you what that threshold is. It feels to me like we're going to be past that by early 2022. And that's fantastic. And then whether there's a new variant and another round of inoculation needed, well, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. I just think between now and Christmas, we could be making smarter decisions around vaccination policy or policy in terms of what you're able to do with vaccination and around the restrictions that we have lifted. Colin, that's ending on a hopeful note, even though there are definitely some things to be concerned about. I really want to thank you for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Colin Furness is an infection control epidemiologist and assistant professor at the University of Toronto. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajan Budler, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etesas. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 